Hi, everyone. Today on the show, we have Ricky Herrera from Swag Sydney, Australia. Hi, Ricky. How are you? How's things? Uh, yeah. as well. <laughs> How are you? Good, good. Uh, a, a bit uh, rushed today because uh, we just finished the dinner at Liverpool this afternoon and um, just getting everything settled at the moment. But overall, amazing. Oh, good. Now, you started Swag. Now, it's through your past and your life experiences that's brought you to create Swag. Can you just give us a rundown on what happened and how you created Swag? Okay. Well, look, uh, a few times in my life, I personally became homeless. Um, you know, young age on the streets. And as I got older, back on the streets. And as an adult with family, um, we hit tough times. So, uh, unfortunately, some bad choices and some things just didn't go my way. But um, finding myself in that situation with nobody to turn to um, just sort of did something to me. Uh, when I was younger, about 19, I was um, couch surfing. So I was just jumping from place to place to place to place. and. I met this amazing lady, um, Sister Eunice. Um, she, she runs our regional team. Um, she's an amazing woman of God, loves God, um, just a beautiful lady. And she had a family, so on, and found out that I was moving around different places. So she took me in. She just said, you know, look, you can come and stay here. And she didn't know me. She didn't know who I was. And um, anyway... They, they, you know, they shared the word of God with me, prayed with me, sort of encouraged me to keep going. But what got me was while I was living there, uh, she had a caravan out the backyard. So, so she was living in the housing commission. So she wasn't well off. She was, she was just living week to week like most families. She had two little babies. And she had some people staying in the back of the caravan, and they were um, heroin, heroin addicts. Okay, and I remember saying yeah. to her, and I said to her, "Why would you let these people stay here?" This is what I said. Yeah, I've been, um, you know, aren't you worried about your kids? This and that, and she just stopped me and looked at me and she said, "Who else is going to show them God's love?" Oh my goodness, <laughs> that is beautiful. And when she said that to me, I realized, even though I was in a bad place myself, look how quick I was to judge these people. Mm. Do you understand what I mean? Mm. Like I was in a bad place and not through drugs and that, but it didn't matter. I was still in a bad place. And had she not taken me in to show me that seed of love and compassion, maybe that seed wouldn't have become fruitful today. And then what happened later on down the track, you know, we started running a soup kitchen together with her, you know, Macquarie Field. This over thirty years. We're talking about thirty years ago. And we started My running goodness, yeah. So we started running soup kitchens in Macquarie Fields and we started working with the community and so on. And all, all through my marriage, I remember um, we ran youth programs, we tried to foster kids along the way to help out. Yeah. Like we always did something to to bring the community together. But then in about two thousand and 10, 11, my building company collapsed. Um, and I made some bad investments for whatever reason. Yeah, like at the end of the day, um, I took some big risk and the risk didn't sort of go my way, right? But I, I found myself with no home. Three kids and one on the way. And thinking myself, and I couldn't even get a rental property since. I had oh, money. Oh you got to understand. I had money put aside from when we okay. we paid we paid our debts to you know our trades and stuff and the people that mattered at the at the time. And then I had to go for for bankruptcy. Um, and my I tried to get, approach a couple of real estates and said, look, I'd like to rent a place. I'll pay for a year, but because I was blacklisted, mm -hmm. I couldn't get a place. So we were living in motels for a bit. And I was like, wow, man, 
all the years of service, this and that, this happened to me. Like, you know, you start to think to yourself, like, why? But I'm glad it happened. I'm glad it happened because when <laughs> Because of that, because of that situation I was in, because I hit such a tough spot in my life, and I'm talking about things I've seen growing up as well, like, you know, being that little kid in the back of a car, you know, fleeing domestic violence and, and moving like like over, you know, 16 schools before I hit a high school, yeah. You know? I mean, like, we're talking about a constant, unstable, I guess, environment, yet I had a beautiful mother that cooked, cleaned, looked after us the best she could, yeah. You know I mean? Um but, you know, unfortunately, it was the people in her life that, that didn't go that way, you know. And um, so as soon as we got a rental property, uh, myself, my wife, my ex-wife at, at now, but my wife at the time, um, and my three kids, my baby was born, like, like my little, and it, we realized there are people out there that are in the same spot. Oh, they don't have yeah. they don't have that help. They don't have mm. the support. For whatever mm. reason, they don't have the support. Yeah, they could be struggling with so we went out to the city one night and um I really felt strongly that God put on my heart to go out and help these people, you know, like just to go out and do something. Yeah. So we hit the streets and I didn't know what to expect. I really thought I was gonna be talking, uh, maybe feeding ten people, maybe well, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what we were going to do. And our first night out on the street, we uh, rock up and we only have enough meals for like 10 or 20 people. And when you look up at the line, there was like over 100 people standing there. Oh, my goodness. I heard this story. This is amazing. Yeah. Oh. So, so, so it was our first night there and, and my son said to me, what are we going to do, Dad? I said, my older boy. And I said, I'm not sure. I have no idea um, what we're going to do from here. And then Fox Studios van was driving around, and they had a function at Fox Studio. And and um, the guy stops in the middle of nowhere and says, look, I've got all this food. I don't know where to take it. And and, and, and I said, bro, you could drop it here. Like it was like God sent. Um, uh, God and, works in mysterious ways. Oh, 100%. And then from that day, we started going out weekly. First, it started with a Saturday night, then Monday morning breakfast. And this is over years. So this is not just one off. This is every single week in, week out, week in, week out, week in, week out. And then we start uh, helping um, some of the homeless to get cleaned up, putting them in motels, trying to help them get through. And then as we got... Uh, further down, we started like, you know, Swag, Lawara. We started hitting different areas. <clears throat> Macquarie Fuel. And mind, you, and mind you, this is no help from anyone. This is self funding. No. Yeah, this is that's no, right. no, this is what, no. This is what people got to hear, Rick, because no. they don't understand. Well, well, that's the thing, right? So, so no government funding, only people helping people. And basically, we were funding it all the first years anyway because I, I was working I had, I had different work come up and so on but I think what the beauty was that people came together started cooking started bringing out meals started helping where they could um we put a call out and say look we've got an elderly man that um just got out of hospital um any chance we can put him in a motel for a week just to get him on his feet and somebody would put their hand up and say, I'll cover two nights, and somebody else would say, I'll cover another two nights. Now, we never used to – when we started, we didn't do videos. Like, we didn't do any – it was just something God put on our heart. But then we started doing the Facebook videos to get the support because we we started off feeding 100, next minute it was 200, next minute 300, and the next minute a week we're doing three, 400, 500 people. You can't do it on your own. You know what I'm saying? It's so true. Um, also, these are the questions that I wanted to ask you because people are asking me. They reckon there's no homeless in Sydney. Okay, well, well you know what? I, <laughs> honestly, okay, look, look, look. I, I can honestly tell you that we have helped hundreds of people get off the streets by far, help them get their lives back in order and so on. But I can tell you at any one given time, there is over a thousand people sleeping rough in the city of Sydney. 
any time. There you go. You, there you, go. You, you may not see it because you go during the day and you'll see a few homeless here and there. Yeah. But I can reassure you, if you did a trip with me at night and you'll see that we took over 3,000 sleeping bags to the streets, the people that were sleeping rough, from Wentworth Park, Central, Martin Place, Ullamaloo, all the way through the city, Liverpool, all the way down to uh, Campbelltown Way, all the way down to uh, Bidwell, Wollongong, all the way down the Central Coast, all the way down to Orange. Now, you tell me. Uh, and, and also, it's not just being homeless. There's a lot more behind them being homeless because everyone says, you know, they've got the government help, they can support them and this and that. But people don't know it's a lot to do with mental health as well. <laughs> Okay, well, let's get back to that. People say, how come they're homeless? Why hasn't the government looked after it? Yep. Okay. No address, no payment. Have no, you ever right. tried to get Centrelink payments and say that you don't know where you live? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. If you walked into Centrelink today and they said, where are you staying? Nowhere. They'll say, oh, well, you need an address. Yeah. How are they going to call how the job network going to call you? Where's your phone? I've got no phone. Well, mm. we can't get in contact with you. It's like a cat. To, you can't get a place without the payment, without the pay. Now, the payment, so people get it through their head, is not this record. You get $440 a fortnight plus maybe rent assistance, which is maybe 100 bucks. Try to get a one-bedroom apartment anywhere in Sydney for less than 200 bucks a week. If you get shared accommodation, you're sharing a bathroom with six or seven ice addicts, drug addicts, and I can take you yourself. If you say it's better than living on the streets, then I'll take you to some of these places and I guarantee you end up on the streets. Because well, they're if anyone, Yeah, Rick, if anyone knows it's you, um, I had the well, the honour of being with you, um, going to Wollongong, I saw with my own eyes, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and it's just amazing. Even uh, Swag in Wollongong, your team there, like the family, the children getting behind, cooking and feeding them and then seeing who they are. It, it, look, look, what blows me away. Hello, sorry, we've got a... Yeah, you've got a little lag in the network. We froze, we paused. Are we back? What happened there? Oh, man, I think we paused, we start. Hello. Oh, there. Oh. Sorry, we just froze. <laughs> We're I, was back. Just, I was like. Yes. <laughs> I was like, Rick, Rick, <laughs> oh, we're back. Yeah, people don't re people don't realize unless they actually go with you. Seriously, what goes on? You know, I, I I say to people, come out and see what we do, and then you'll get a better understanding. Come and talk to the homeless. Come and talk to the families. What we've noticed since this pandemic hit, okay, is that there has been a massive demand for women and babies and families. And when I say women, I'm talking about domestic violence here, okay? I'm talking about women... The radio itself, three, four weeks ago, was saying over 6,000 Australian women are sleeping in cars with children. So this is what the government knows. And then we had over 9,000 women, over 50 that are homeless. Okay, so we know this. And then we start getting the phone calls. Yeah. There's a mother in need. She's got no support. So we try to get them in the maid cell. Then we try to find out who can help them. So we do, we're we not saying we're the lifeline here. We're not saying we're, we're, we're the ones that can save them. We're, we're doing what we can. That's so right. somebody calls up, I'm not going to leave a baby in the car. I don't care who it is. They don't have to be family. That's you understand? Right. This is a broken mother 
with a child that is going to be traumatised for the rest of their life if we don't step in. That's so true. And you've got a mother you showed, uh, showed me a picture of, which, oh, my gosh. God bless you, Rick. You've got a big heart. You even use your own home to put these people in for temporary stay. Well, the thing is, look, you know, I'm a granddad. I'm a father of four. My older son runs a homeless charity at a lot like a homeless dinner at Wollongong on a Thursday night through Lighthouse Church. And my kids are all involved. My boy was out with us today at Liverpool. Um, even the ex wife and her partner came today to Liverpool, right? So, yeah, so, so the thing is, you know, I'm trying to install the kids, not to let your ego take the better of you, not to put yourself above everyone else. So you're not God. You're not. You're special because God has made you special, okay? Mm -hmm. But don't take that gift that God's given you and turn it into an ugly gift where you think you're above somebody else because you're in a better place financially. You're in a better place because you've got – you know what? We don't know the circumstance that people go through, okay? That's I fine. can tell you now, over 48% of the people on the streets have gone through foster care. Now – I just want to break that down just so people get a little understanding, right? You imagine this. You're a child already abandoned by mother and father, okay? Now, you've been given a family for maybe three, four years, whatever it is, you're with this family. And then you get to five years old thinking that this is your family. Yeah. And then you get placed in another family. Yeah. And then it's you get sad. attached to this family, and then you get placed to another family. And by the time you'll reach 18, you've gone through four families. How much rejection and trauma does that child have? Even if the people that they were with are great people, don't get me wrong. Yeah. They might have, you get that, obviously you get the ones that abuse and so on and that because it's a sick world we live in, right? But we're talking about even if you're in a good family, how would you feel when you hit 18 knowing that nobody wanted you? Yeah. And you're supposed to get out there and fit into society when you haven't been properly equipped. Yeah. You've got your self-worth is nothing. You don't believe in yourself because nobody believed in you. Yeah. You feel like a failure because you've woken up, everybody's woken up with mum and dad hugging them and you don't have that that yeah. pleasure of having that. Do you know what I'm saying? So how can we sit there and say these people want to be homeless? Do you understand? Yeah. They have chosen that path because it's the only way out. That's true. No, you because, uh, yeah, you, you created swag. Can you tell us yeah. the meaning of swag? Okay, look, salvation with Almighty God, okay? And because swag relates to the old swag men back in the day, you know, like uh, once the jolly swag men, you yeah. know, is that sort of... <laughs> It sort of likes to say, people sleep, okay. and then you and then you got swag. Like my kids always said, "Dad, you got style. You you got oh, okay. swag." So the whole thing went together. But I want to break it down to salvation with Almighty God. I tell you why, because you know we are all God's children. So true. I don't, do not care if the person believes in Christ or not. I tell you now, I don't care if the brother goes to church or doesn't go to church. I don't care if he has a different belief system. I do know this. We've been put on this planet together. We all bleed. We all feel pain. Yep. We all suffer when somebody gets yep. taken away. Yep. We all hurt. How could and, we possibly... and we're all born in this world the same way and we all exit the world the same way. That's right. So how, how can we sit there and say that we are above the next person? How can we possibly think that there isn't a God that put us here together how can we sit there and not have compassion for our fellow brother and sister when they're hurting so but, true. you know what i mean so I'm, I'm i'm not here to convert people i'm not here like my 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 mission has always been to serve the way christ would serve yeah. and somebody said to me oh but all these wars are about religion this i'm not about these wars i i wasn't in charge of the wars i wasn't in charge of the greed i wasn't in charge you look at my lifestyle, I'm as broke as they get, but I live by, God blesses me, I, I, I work, I I make my money week to week, my kids have clothes to wear. If I don't have it, I give my last jacket to somebody. It makes no difference, you know. Uh, like, 
Yeah, I saw that. I witnessed that when I was in Wollongong with you. Your favourite jumper you just bought. <laughs> God bless you. You saw this girl and she just had a singlet top on and you said, and she was cold and it was freezing. You said, come here. You took her to your van. You gave her a brand new jumper, your favourite jumper you told me, and you gave it to her to put it on to protect her because being in the state she was, someone could have taken advantage of her. Oh, my That's God. Rick, it shows the man you are, which is well, absolutely incredible. Well, the thing is, like, like I've always said to somebody, don't tell me you love me, show me you love me. Mm. Don't tell me you love me. I don't want to hear people people's words anymore. Like, like, I don't want to hear a politician get up and say, we're going to kill homelessness forever. I couldn't care. I don't want to hear that. Mm. I, want to, I want to see people Action come off the street. I want to see people getting off the street. I want to see people looking at each other and saying, you know what? You're my brother. You're my sister. And what can I do to help you? I want to see a world where we start to look at each other and not judge each other for our, but but sit there and look at each other through a righteous love and say, you know what? I didn't go through what you've been through. I may not understand. Maybe if you explain to me where you've come from so I can actually understand the path you've taken mm -hmm. rather than sit there and say, you're a junkie, you're a prostitute, yeah. Yeah. you're a thief. You're a gambler. You're this. You're that. Come on. Listen, we have over 3 million people on anxiety tablets in Australia. We have over 2 million people on antidepressants. That's 5 mil. We have a population of 24,000, I think, uh, 24 million or 22 million, whatever it is. You break it down, you take the kids from 15 under and you take the people from 55 over, right? So you leave yourself a margin of 15 to 55-year-olds. That gap, gap. Then you break the stats down. That means one in four, I think, one in four roughly Australians are suffering with one of these things. Okay? But that's not the only thing. you got post-traumatic stress. Mm. you got abuse. You got childhood abuse. You got mental abuse. You got physical abuse. These are all things that people are living with. So there's not one of us that can say the perfect world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just because my my mother wasn't rich mm. didn't make her a fantastic mother. Mm. To go through what she did, you know, when I was younger, I used to sit there and sometimes I think you look for self pity, right? Like, like along the way, you think, oh, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me, this happened to me. And not once did I think about how strong she was to get through what she did. Mm. Not once did I think what she had to go through to try to keep a roof over our head, to try to put food on the table. All I kept thinking about, what I missed. Yeah. No dad, no this, the Christmases, we didn't get the gifts we wanted, didn't get the birthdays we wanted. Because my birthday's on the 3rd of January. So everybody's broke after Christmas. I never really got gifts. Yes. Because they're, but you think about it, New Year's Eve, yeah. they're all blown. By the time they get to me, they're all <laughs> waiting for the next paycheck, right? So as a kid, I used to miss out on the best gifts. Yeah. But, but all I'm saying is that that I had to change the way I saw things, okay? And when I put myself in her shoes, well. That's when you saw her again. Well, I realized what an amazing woman she was, honestly, to, to be able to stand there and take that role, that mantle, take the place of a father and mother, okay? Like that, 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 that was the heartbeat for me. And then I, I turn around, I look at what some of these people are going through today. You know, we all struggle. We all struggle. We all have something that happens. And when my marriage uh, broke up, I finished, I remember saying, you know, I've lost my family. This is how I saw it first. I looked 
at first, you know, the first three months, I tell I'm losing my family. And that's all I could think about. I'm losing my family. Everything that I worked for, everything I've, is gone. And then I had to stop and put my ego back a bit. This is, And I thought, well, maybe it's taken a different shape. Yeah. Maybe it's not the shape I expected it to be. I didn't really lose my family because my kids are always with me. My my kids end up coming with me and, and now we're sharing the load and my daughter, my granddaughter live with me. And, I, and yeah, but it's taken a different shape. So I had to look at it different. Do you understand? Yeah. So rather look at what I lost, I looked at the different form it's taken, right? And then I was able to deal with things a bit better. I was able to encourage and, and still support the ex-wife with her <clears throat> but and <clears throat> keep it as um, a, a family unit so everybody could still talk and this and that. And, yeah, you, you know, obviously it's never going to be that, you know, come out of my place, hang out, this and that. That's not me. I'm not that guy, right? But, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. But I wanted to have it so that I could teach my kids the most valuable lesson that life can give us is first to forgive. Yeah, number one. First, first to forgive. Yes. Why? Because if you can't let go, you'll never grow. Do you understand that? Yeah. The second thing I want to, to understand was that everybody goes through different storms. And the difference is how we go through it. That's some true. go through some go through and they just take it as it comes. Others turn around, they get crazy. They get abusive, they whatever. Okay. And not to let your past determine your future. Okay. So my past is my past. It's happened. Okay. My present is now the way I conduct myself today. I had bad things happen along the way. I've had bad things happen in my past. I've made bad decisions in my past. Haven't but, we all? Haven't we all? <laughs> but today, I get up, and what what do I say about today? Hey, you know what? I may have stuffed everything up, but I can make amends to this. I can fix something today. If I turn around, if I haven't been lovable, loving to my kids, just say, this is for someone that may be listening today. If I haven't been loving to my kids, take that mantle today and say, you know what? I'm going to change the way I look at my kids. Just because my dad wasn't lovable to me doesn't mean I'm going to be the son of my kids. That's that's a load of crap. You don't need to carry that on. That's a generational curse, I call it, right? Okay. But you turn around. You grab your kids. You tell them how much you love them. You tell them how much they mean to you. First, you apologize to anyone that you may have done damage to for your actions. And whether they forgive you or not, you make peace with them. Do you understand? And that's then, true. And then you start looking at the things you can do to make this world a better place. So you might not have money. It doesn't matter. You still can get up and talk to someone, yep. sit down with an old lady, sit down with an old man. Help. You can sit there. You can do something good. That's right. And just remember that your future is determined by what you do now, not by what you had happen to you in the past. That's so true. you can make things better. Every day that you get up, if you look at it and say, you know what, I thank you, Lord, for the day I'm about to have. I thank you, Lord, for the people you've put in my way. I pray that whatever I see along the way, I'm able to help. If I can make a difference, put a smile on someone's face. But don't think that you're insignificant. People think because they don't have money, they don't have this and that, that they can't do anything. You saw it with yourself. You go to Wollongong, just be in there, and you yeah. make a difference in someone's life. Oh, you know and not only that, they're happy. <laughs> they were happy too. Like, it oh. was... The joy you get from him as well is incredible. If you remember at the end, we had a couple, we had two women that were broken down, right? Okay, so we had one distressed about something else, but we couldn't just leave and leave them like that. That's right, yeah. We had to leave and know that they were going to be in a better place. That's right. And you see, simply by showing them that love and compassion, that someone yeah. cares, that someone actually cares, you know? Just to hold them and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. Yeah. 
It's going to be okay. Don't give up. You may be going. That's all. Sometimes people just need just to just to hundred percent. Look, sometimes. (laughs) Also, um, um, Ricky, you've got your first event coming up, haven't you? Do you want to tell people about that? We've got our first charity event. Look, after ten years of service on the streets and constantly running out of finances to keep going because we do. Um, unfortunately, all my volunteers can tell you, especially our committee, um, we are the most giving people on this planet, I can tell you now. Um, I do not care if it's our last $50, if it's our last 100 if it comes out of my wallet, it comes out of your wallet. If your wallet's in the car, you better put it away. Because <clears throat> if somebody comes up knocking on my window, and need something, I'm going to grab whatever's there. You okay? would. <laughs> I, you would. I know you. <laughs> I've seen just, it with my own eyes. Yeah. It, it's the way I am. But yeah. this charity event on the 10th of August, it's the first event that we've held. Uh, we've made it um, a formal event. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. We've made it a formal event, and we've uh, it's got a three-course dinner, DJ. It's going to be raffles, functions. Um, it's $127 a ticket, but not because the money goes to us. It's like $68 or something to the venue, $7 for the people that organise the tickets, and then we get like $60 out of that. But I'll be honest with you. I do not care if we come out of it with $10,000 or 50 bucks. I'll be honest with you. The most important thing I said to my volunteers about this event is that everybody gets to know each other and they walk away different than the way they came in. Oh, that's beautiful. (laughs) I said, 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 I'm not fussed, trust me, because they're all concerned about what if we're – I said, don't worry about that. I tell you what, if God wants to bless, God will always bless. I agree. If God wants to bless, look, I'll get a phone call tomorrow and somebody will say, listen, brother, we want to put this in your account to help you with whatever. I believe that. I was that guy that used to do that. I used to, let me tell you, when I had my building company, in a period of five years, we gave over half a million dollars out to different people, different groups, different families. I had no problem giving away money. You understand? Not because I don't respect it or value it. I believe that God blessed me to bless others. That's it. That was my purpose, right? Everybody will say, oh, you know, you could have saved it. Okay, look, you know what? Maybe that's where you're at. But I can tell you now, the people around me, even if I have nothing, will still be around me. You understand that? Yeah. I don't have I don't have people a bit around me because of what I have. I have people around me because of who genuine. I am. Yeah, genuine so, and real and true. Friends. Yeah. There are people that are in your life because of the things you have to give them. Yeah. Yeah. But there are people in my life that are there because of who I am to them. That's you know what I'm saying? And I'd rather be somebody that the people can turn to, talk to, trust, and, and find a bit of empathy in there, you know? And, um, and look, you know what? Um, there's nothing – look, look. about two years ago, I'll give you a little scenario – and then we'll go back to this fundraiser. So if you're able to support it, we, we've got five more tables we need to um, sell. So, guys, yeah. Come on, Sydney, uh, Australia. We've got to make it. Come on, guys. We have to see you all there. Come on, guys. <laughs> get, get on our link. And That's honestly, right. guys, um, I can honestly tell you, when the, the pandemic hit, let me just make this very clear. When the pandemic hit, we were the only charity – in the country that was out there every single day of the week for two, nearly 200 days. We gave over 100,000 meals. We picked up from restaurants like Chicken Ace, Satini's, Chickalicious, Italian Bowl. We had families cooking every day. We covered the cost, not the government. We paid for the fuel. I got hit with $8,000 worth of toll fees. Um, so I'm just saying this is to the extent of how we went to get out there. And the whole purpose of what we do is to make sure that people come out and 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 feel a part of something. Now, nothing we do is so that we benefit. So it's not for me that my blessing already comes. You don't understand. My blessing comes. I'm blessed. I've got kids, amazing kids around me. I've got beautiful family. And, uh, you know, sometimes I struggle as well, but we get through. 
But I'm going how for do you, Like I was, I was discussing this with you. How do you get through like your moments? Because there's times that sometimes you feel like giving up. That's like with everyone in general and in life. How do you cope with that, Ricky? Really, that's... I've had moments where I felt like giving up. Now, on the night of the um, event, you're going to see some families get up. Like there's going to be a couple of families that share about how we help them get through. There's going to be some homeless guys that talk about how we were able to get them out and help them get through and so on. But it's those moments that I feel like giving up that I look back and I kid you not, nearly every time I've had a phone call from somebody that says, thank you so much, Rick. You know, I'm able to get back with my, or somebody will call up and say, when everybody closed their doors, you guys didn't even know us and you were there to pick us up. And so these little moments that we have and, and my volunteers, honestly, the people around me are, are amazing. You, if, if you come out, you'll see for yourself. At my lowest point, sometimes I get that phone call, that one phone call. So, yeah, keep going. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much. And they'll be encouraging me, but they don't realize at that moment what I'm going through. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think the hardest thing for me to do, I'll be honest with you, is turning people away. I know. And you've, you've had your fair trials and tribulations this weekend, too. Uh, Unbelievable. I know. And I feel for you because I see your post too when we talk. And it's like it just really hits you in the heart because I know the person you are and how much you want to help them and you can't. You've got your own home open to helping so many and you can't give any more of yourself, Ricky. Well, you can't. I've got a two-bedroom apartment that we're renting, so it's not my apartment, but, yeah, renting. And hopefully my real estate don't really care whether <laughs> that's <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Who's your real estate agent, Rick? <laughs> uh, they're beautiful people. Um, and, and the thing is, I get out there and, you know, we see a situation. I've got kids, like, up until uh, Christmas, I had the kids full time. So imagine you've got two kids, they got my bed. My daughter, granddaughter have their room. I've got the lounge. But I love where I live. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. But we still can't close the door. You know, I'm saying? I, I can't, I've got nowhere to put them, but what do I do? I put them in the, I put calls out. Don't get me wrong. I put calls out to see if somebody can take them. Yeah, but, I know. I know you've been trying hard, especially these last couple of days, and it's been so cold. Man, I hear winter, you. Winter, winter for me is the worst time of year ever. Like, winter for me is – you'll probably see me the most stressed on all my videos – and you, if you look, it's between winter. We, I'll be honest with you. If it wasn't for our volunteers, people aren't, aren't donating. People aren't giving the way they used to give ever since this pandemic. You want to know how bad it got? Before, about three months before uh, the pandemic, uh, two months before the pandemic hit, um, there was a family and kids um, that couldn't get any rental assistance place. So they hit, so this family needed somewhere to stay. And it was for a period of six months before they went back to New Zealand, okay? And I said to my daughter, listen, because she was living with me and granddaughter at the time, and I said to her, listen, mate, I'll find another unit for us. Oh. Uh, I said, you go stay with your mum for a month, and I'll um I'll find somewhere for us, but these guys need the place. They got they get they got no help. So we gave them the unit, paid up until the six month they were in there, left all the furniture for them, and moved out. Now I was thinking because I I I've been working, I had a bit of money put aside that I could just get into a place. And me being as picky as I am, I didn't want to just get into anything. I wanted something nice. But the COVID hit. Oh. And I couldn't get into a rental property to find a place because nobody was taking inspections. And oh, so no. I, and <laughs> Where did you end up going? I slept in my van for four months while I was feeding on the streets. I, that alone tells me who was, you are. I was showering, and you asked my kids and my ex-wife and my partner at the time. 
I was showering at the gym before they closed the gyms. I couldn't go to the gym. I I showered at the beach until they took the taps off. But lucky for me, I'm a builder, so I managed to um, (laughs) save the the water. I, I, I got my way of turning the water back on. But what I'm saying is this was winter, and I was getting out, having cold showers, sleeping in the van, washing my clothes. And laundry. Somebody realized I was in trouble when they saw me at the laundry mat every couple of days. They said, Rick, what happened? I said, I said my washing machine broke down, right? <laughs> God I- bless you. You know what? That says a lot about your character and who you are and how, how giving you are. You're willing to give up your own home, your own um, privacy, everything. But you know what? Um, if you had a message to give to everyone in the world today, what would that message be? I would say a simple act of kindness can change someone's world. A simple act of kindness, right? And I would say this, that if God has blessed you in a way that you feel like you've got everything you need, take a second to think about somebody else that's not that fortunate. You know, the uh, the old lady passed away about, there was an old lady, Rose, beautiful lady, Aboriginal lady. I met her 15 years ago when I was um, building a a duplex or doing a reno in in Surrey Hills Way. I see this old lady, beautiful lady, just reading the Bible, this and that, sitting on the corner. Now, mind you, she couldn't read. (laughs) No, she, she couldn't read. But she'd open the Bible, she's sitting there, and I see her picking up the young kid, like a young girl, saying, listen, darling. So anyway, so I put her my, I took her off the street, gave her dinner, and I said, where do you stay? She says, I'm, I'm meant to be here. God has got me here with these young girls to protect them. Oh and I'm thinking to myself, and she was taking in girls off the street that were like about to get on drugs, and she was helping them like an like an angel, honestly. And anyway, she got sick, and I went to see her in the hospital, and she grabbed my hand. I'll never forget. And she said to me, "To the world, you're one person, Rick, but to that person, you're definitely the world." Oh, that is amazing. <laughs> well, we're running out of time, Rick. I thank you so much with all my heart. Thank you for being you, being true, being real, being genuine and being so giving. You're impacting the world without even realising it, Rick. And I thank you for having you in my life. I really appreciate you. Um, Just one more thing. If they wanted to contact you, where can people contact you? Okay, www.swagfamilysydney.com.au. That's our website. It hasn't been updated in eight years, but it still works. Um, (laughs) So don't worry about it. Jump, jump on a Facebook and you'll see um, Swag Family Sydney. Send us a message. I'll get all the messages and I'll, I'll respond back to you whichever way you can. Okay. Um, and otherwise, just follow us and maybe come on out one day and you'll see you get to meet us in person. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you. God bless him. He's in his van taking this interview. <laughs> it's only good. As you know, my, my place is full at the moment. I know. God keep you healthy and well always. So signing off for now from the talk show Angel at the Verco Show. Bless Hi, you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.